we always have fun uh, doing kids sing, and it's it's great to hear the young kids as they're trying to learn their cards and learn the Bible, and uh, you know remember the importance of the Bible, and we're trying to instill those things into them. Uh, so that's always a wonderful time we have set aside. Now it's time for us to turn our minds to worship God tonight, uh, to go through the acts of worship that He has prescribed in the New Testament, and so we're going to begin that worship tonight with a word of prayer. And if you would, let's bow together, and then we'll turn the services over to Jerome. Our God above, we are eternally grateful for the blessings that you have given us. Uh, we're thankful for Jesus, and we're thankful for his sacrifice on the cross. Lord, we pray that you be with each one of us tonight as we worship you. Help us to do so in spirit and in truth. Help us to follow the pattern that you've laid out for us in your word, that we may pour out our love and our adoration and praise to you. Lord, we pray that you be with all those who will participate in worship this evening. Help them to do so uh, with a mindset to glorify you and help us to offer up this worship as a sweet-smelling aroma before you. Lord, we pray that you be with the elders of this congregation, the deacons, and all those in leadership. We pray that you help each one of them uh, to lead in such a way that they would bring glory to you and help the church grow. And we're so thankful for everyone that is a part of this congregation. We pray your blessings on each one of them. Lord, we especially pray for those who are sick. Help us to reach out to them and encourage them. And we pray for those uh, who are struggling at this time. And we pray that we also can reach out and encourage them. Lord, we're especially grateful for the sacrifice of Jesus. We're thankful that he stands as our medium between us and you. Uh, and Lord, we are so grateful for his advocacy. We pray all this through his name. Amen. Home of the soul. If for the prize we have striven after our labors are over, rest to our souls will be given on the eternal shore. Home of the soul. Sing the story. Here was the 
Long for the lesson, just over in the glory land. <clears throat> I have a home prepared where the saints abide, just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side, just over in the glory land. Just It's good to see all of you tonight. Uh, take your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, that will be the first text that we begin with tonight. Matthew chapter 8, and as I announced just a moment ago, tonight is Q&A night. And remember, uh, at the beginning of this year, we presented somewhat of a... Uh, a plan for this year that centered around a specific theme, but that plan also centered around us trying to use Sunday nights in a very uh, pointed and a very specific way. And uh, tonight will be no different because the second Sunday night of every month, we're going to answer the questions that you have submitted that are in the box. Now, last Sunday night, I covered three questions, and uh, I plan to cover three questions again tonight. It just so happens that all three of those questions ended up being on a single card. Now, I had planned to cover three cards, but uh, I'm operating with a little bit of self-awareness tonight, knowing that if I cover three cards and each one of those cards had multiple questions, we'd just be here forever. So I decided to cover three questions on one card. And uh, since we're not uh, doing what we had planned on the fourth Sunday night yet, because we haven't um, gone through the preacher training class, uh, we don't have any uh, young men to be preaching on that last Sunday night yet, so we're going to do a double Q&A this month. Uh, we'll do that again on the fourth Sunday night of this month and cover some of the other questions I promised you last month. Um, and so we'll talk some more about that as we get close. The questions that you and I are going to cover tonight are questions that I can almost guarantee you every single one of you have asked this question and have wrestled with this question at some point in your life. In fact, when I have done Q&As in the past, this has probably been one of the most requested questions that I have ever been given, and it comes in the form of three questions tonight. We'll answer all three of those, but really they're all somewhat of the same question. Three questions, or what we're going to say is a three-part question tonight. What we'll do is we'll go through each question and try to evaluate. We're going to combine some ideas in them, and uh, you'll see what we're going to do as we uh, go through these. Here's the three questions that are on our single card for tonight. Question number one, when we get to heaven, will we go, uh, are we going to have a big reunion? That's how the first question is poised. 
Second question on this same card, when we get to heaven, are we going to recognize our relatives and others? Third question on this card, will we miss our family members who do not make it to heaven? If you've been a Christian or you have been involved in studying the Bible for any length of time and you've begun to wrestle with this idea of heaven, you've asked this question, am I going to recognize people when I get to heaven? The other people around me that have also made it to heaven, are we going to know one another? Now, there's a couple of things I need to set out before we dive into this question or these three questions that I want us all to understand. First of all, if you look in the books of Daniel, the book of uh, there's some imagery in the book of Ezekiel, and then, of course, the book of Revelation, as we're given somewhat of what the prophets and John could put into words of what heaven is like, we know that one of the major functions of our existence in heaven is to praise God. That's one of the things that we will do on a regular basis. In fact, in the second service this morning, Mike referenced that in heaven we're going to be singing. And he happened to point out that in heaven there will be no preaching. And he said that right before the sermon. <laughs> so I don't know. You just take that how you will. But uh, we do know the Bible teaches us that uh, the hosts of heaven that are there now are praising God and that we for eternity will praise God. That's one thing that I want to set out. Because we're not going to address the idea of us praising God in heaven in this question. I want us to know that that is a, a very present reality. But this question doesn't have anything to do with us praising God. It has more to do with when we're in heaven, will we recognize the others that are around us? So I don't want you to think by answering the question the way I do that I'm ignoring the fact that heaven will be a place of praise to God. I want to point that out. It is a place where we will eternally praise God and sing his praises. But there are also other areas of heaven that you're probably interested in, and this is one of them. Will you recognize people in heaven? What will the interaction between us and others be like in heaven? You've probably heard someone say before that when they get to heaven, they want to sit down with Moses or Noah or Peter or Paul, Jeremiah, maybe David, Solomon, have a conversation is that what the interaction will be like in, in heaven? What do we know? What do we see in the scriptures? And then, what about the people that, if we do know others, that are not there? What are we going to know about them? I'm going to present to you what I found in the Bible because I found a lot more than I thought I was going to. kind of had the canned preacher answer, and as I studied, I found more and more and more. The purpose of Sunday nights this year, I want to use them to dive deep into God's Word. So I hope you got your Bibles ready because we're about to dive deep into the Word of God. Let's answer our first question. Kind of the general idea, we're going to combine two questions. The first one being, when we get to heaven, are we going to have a big reunion? And will we recognize our relatives and others? Essentially, that question is asking an umbrella question, will we know each other? You know, that's kind of the big umbrella question that we're going to answer real quick. And then we'll dive into some of the specifics. Will you and I know each other in heaven? And to answer that question, I have to give you a yes, 100% fact, you and I will know each other in heaven. Now, as I read and studied for this, there were a lot of people said, well, we don't know, it's not really certain, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of information. And folks, as I studied, I could not get around the idea that the Bible says we're going to know each other when we're in heaven. And let me show you that. I don't want to just say that. I want to turn your mind to God's Word and show you why I found that and why I say that 100% you and I are going to know each other in heaven. Now, I don't see the blessing or the value of heaven being a place where we are together. If you and I don't know each other, you don't know me and I don't know you. I don't see the value of that, of heaven being a place where we're going to be together to praise God. So first of all, I want to point that out. Let's look at a couple of passages. I asked you to open up to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, Jesus is speaking to the Jews of his day. We're going to be reading verses 11 and 12. Jesus is speaking to the Jews of his day. Really what he's talking about is that the Gentiles are going to come into the kingdom of God, which was a pill that was kind of hard for the Jews to swallow. And in fact, in this passage, Jesus even gets to the point that he says some Jews will not be brought into the kingdom of heaven. You'll see that there in Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. This is what Jesus said. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. While the sons of the kingdom of heaven were thrown out into outer darkness, some of your translations may be, say they, they'll be shut out. 
be thrown into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let me point out something. We're going to return to Matthew 8 at the end of this lesson. But let me point out initially that I don't see a blessing to be had with sitting down at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob if we don't know who Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are, and Jacob, Abraham, and Isaac don't know who we are. Now, I'm going to talk about what I believe this passage is actually referring to. I don't think this is a figurative description of the church. A lot of premillennial ideas come out of this figurative description of the church, that in some way there is an earthly kingdom that Jesus reigns on an actual throne and that will sit down at an actual table with people on earth. I don't think that that's what this is talking about. I'm going to get to why later in the lesson because we'll return to this passage. But I don't see a blessing to be had if I don't know who Jacob is. Isaac and Abraham are, to sit down at table with them, what blessing would there be if I didn't know who they were and they didn't know who I was? All right, take your Bibles and go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. David was sad because he had committed a terrible sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. And I, I want you to draw your mind back to that story of how David had laid with Bathsheba and she had become pregnant and he lied about some things to end up getting Uriah killed. And by getting Uriah killed, he ended up taking Bathsheba and they had this child. And you remember the wise prophet Nathan came to him and called him to the carpet. And David, after having committed that sin and being called to the carpet, the Bible uh, in some translations say that David's repentance was bitter. It was bitter. I don't know if you've ever had to admit something, and that admitting it would be bitter. But David's repentance fell under that category. And God tells David that despite the fact that he has repented of that sin, and he has been forgiven of that sin, that, him, that sin is not going to be held against him in heaven, that there would be some earthly consequences to his sin with Bathsheba. Now, folks, it's important for you and I to realize that that's the world we live in. You know, you and I can be forgiven of a sin. God can toss it into the depths of the sea never to be brought up again. Uh, I believe Micah puts it that way. You and I can be forgiven. That doesn't mean that God wipes away earthly consequences. You and I sometimes, even though God forgives us and we're headed to heaven, we still have to deal with earthly consequences. And that's the product of what David's dealing with here. We sow and we reap. And we're going to reap that which we have sowed. Even though you and I may be forgiven, we have to deal with consequences. So God told David, he informed him in 2 Samuel chapter 12, that the sword would never depart from his house. And you know it didn't. The sword never departed from David's house. There was constant frustration and tension in the house of David. And that the child he had conceived with Bathsheba would die. Look down in your Bibles at 2 Samuel chapter 12. And we're going to read the passages that are on the screen behind me. 2 Samuel chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 16 through 23. 2 Samuel 12, beginning in verse 16. Verse 16, David therefore pleaded with God for the child, and David fasted and went in and laid all night on the ground. So the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground, but he would not. Nor did he eat food with them. Verse 18. Then on the seventh day it came to pass that the child died. So put yourself in the scenario. David is fasting in sackcloth and ashes. And he is begging God to save the life of this child. And exactly what God said was going to happen happened. The child died. And it was on the seventh day there in verse 18 that the child died. And the servants of David, they were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. Well, why? Oh, well, look at how he was dealing with it. He was, he was mourning. He wanted that child to live. He was on the ground. He wouldn't even eat. And so they were afraid to tell David, the king of Israel, that the child had died. For indeed, they said, uh, indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he wouldn't even heed our voice then, right? So how could we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. Some translations say he may do some harm to himself. Verse 19, when David saw that his servants were whispering, David being a perceptive man, perceived that the child was dead. David said to his servants, is the child dead? And his servants answered, he is dead. Verse 20, so David arose from the ground, washed, anointed himself, changed his clothes, went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went to his own house, and when he had requested, they set food before him, and he ate. 
Then his servant said to him, What is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food? So David, in his frustration, knowing that his sin had brought earthly consequences on his fasting, sackcloth and ashes, wanting and begging for God to save this child's life, and what God says happen, is going to happen, happens. The child dies. David perceives the child has died, asks if it's dead, learns it has, and he gets up. He cleans up. He goes and he worships God, and he goes back to eating like a man who would normally operate in the world. Now, the people who saw this, as you can see in the text, they were confused. David, why would you do this? Normally, you would expect someone to, in the midst of a sickness, be ready and on the ready for anyone and anything the child needed. They would be ready to work. You've probably seen this. Someone who's caring for maybe a mother or a father or some kind of relative that is uh, nearing the end of their life. They are busy and they stay busy and they're caring for them and they're doing all these things. And then it's after the person dies that this person goes into a period of grief and mourning. And they go through what psychologists tell us are the five stages of grief. Well, the servants are confused because David was mourning first, and then when the child died, he gets up and goes about what he would normally do. We would probably be confused as well. So they asked him, you fasted, you wept for the child while he was alive? Verse 22 is the answer to this section, verse 22 and 23. While the child was alive, David said, I fasted and wept, for I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? Verse 23, but now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. David said that while the child was living, he had hoped that God was going to bring that child back. But when the child died, he said, why should I fast? Can I bring him back? No, I shall go to him. Let me ask you a question. What consolation did David have of saying that he was going to go to that child if when he went into the time after life on earth... He wasn't going to know the child, and the child wasn't going to know him. What consolation would that bring? He fasted, and he mourned over that child, and when it died, he said, I'm going to go to that child, but what consolation would he have if, if he wouldn't know the child? What consolation if that child wouldn't know him? I think David understood what we would know beyond life. Take your Bibles and go to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. And we're going to read another section here out of this passage, uh, out of this section. You may remember that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Uh, we often teach the, the kids the song that the Sadducees were sad, you see. And uh, we're going to see why. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Now, the history uh, of, of religion uh, in general and the Bible tell us that they didn't believe in the resurrection. In fact, if you look in Matthew 22, 23, it says as much. The same day, the Sadducees who said there is no resurrection. So... The Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection. And uh, oftentimes the Sadducees would argue with the Pharisees because the Pharisees did believe in the resurrection. Now, admittedly, the Pharisees believed kind of a warped view of the resurrection. Uh, if you look into history, the Pharisees often believed that the resurrection, uh, it would happen, but a lot of the physical infirmities we have in life would travel with us into the resurrection, which is a terrible version of the resurrection. It's not what 1 Corinthians 15 teaches. That's not the type of resurrection and hope that the Bible gives us. They saw this resurrection as something that was tethered to the physical. You see, you and I know that the Bible teaches a completely different resurrection. The Bible teaches you and I that the body you and I have right now is mortal. That is, it's subject to death. You and I die. We grow old. Our bones begin to hurt. Our joints begin to hurt. Things in our body began to fail. We grow old. Our body is mortal. It also tells us that our body is corruptible. It can see the effects of sin and the effects of wear and tear of time. Um, you know, as I've, I've gotten older, I use these glasses occasionally. It's really when I need to see something afar off. If I need to see the PowerPoint or I'm trying to see people's reactions. It's kind of hard to tell how people react to your preaching now that we wear masks. I don't really know. All I can see is your eyes. And some of you squint weird like I'm preaching funny, you know. So that's kind of hard to tell. But, you know. You know, I, I may put the glasses on to see, but I need glasses. Uh, my dad didn't need glasses till he was in his 40s, and I really just need him to drive it at night. You know, in heaven, you and I aren't going to need glasses. That's because right now our body is corruptible. It's uh, immortal. But the Bible tells us that you and I are going to receive an immortal, an incorruptible, or a glorified body. 
that we're not going to need glasses to see. You and I aren't going to need to eat because we're not going to get hungry. Our body's not going to have the desires that it has right now. If you use a cane or if you have to take some sort of medication, you're not going to do that in the resurrection. Well, the Pharisees believed a different resurrection than that, which is a terrible resurrection. They don't really offer much hope. But yet the Pharisees and the Sadducees would go back and forth with one another. Everything that is lacking for you and I as human beings, when we die, we'll be taken care of when we get the glorious body. And that's a beautiful thing we can hold on to hope for. But the Sadducees didn't believe that. That's why they're sad. Because they didn't have the belief that they would have the blessings of what the Bible promises us we will have in eternity if we're a child of God. That we will have the immortal body. We will have the incorruptible body. And so the Sadducees didn't believe that. That's why they were sad. So they tried to play a trick on Jesus in Matthew 22. You'll remember they tried to catch him up. Let's read Matthew 22, uh, uh, 23 through 32. The same day the Sadducees, who say there's no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were uh, with us seven brothers. The first died after he'd married, having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second, the third, even to the seventh, last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven shall she be? For they had all had her. Here's a question about the resurrection. Whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection? Now, if you're familiar with Middle Eastern culture, what you'll remember is that they had a, a kind of a law that dates back almost to Abraham, just in the Middle East, of the Leverite marriage. And that basically was a way to secure the inheritance of the family, to make sure the inheritance went the right direction. So if a man has a wife and no heir, he dies... Just as they said, the man, his brother, takes on this dead man's wife and produces offspring. When they produce an offspring, that offspring acts like the child of the dead man and receives the inheritance. It keeps the inheritance within the family. And you can track this. This comes up many times in the biblical text, this marriage code that was a part of the culture of the Middle East. You see it rear its ugly head here in Matthew 22. Now, Jesus' response to them is very interesting. He says two things. He says, number one, you don't know the power of God. Number two, you don't know the scriptures. They said, whose wife should this woman be? First of all, that thing about the power of God is actually quite important. You know, the mundane things in the resurrection about whose wife someone would be, Jesus is essentially saying, you don't know the power of God. God could take care of those things. He can work all those things out. Now, in the text, he tells us exactly how it works out, doesn't he? Because Jesus says in verse 29, you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. So in the resurrection, there is no marriage. We are like the angels. Now, a lot of people have a problem with that, and you probably have at some point in your life. You say, I've spent all this time with this spouse, and we have loved one another, and we've grown close to one another, so you're telling me when I get to heaven, I don't get to be with the person I've loved my entire life. A lot of people have a problem with this no marriage in the resurrection. But it's not really a problem if you look at it from God's perspective. The only thing about marriage that makes it exclusive is the one flesh sexual union that a husband and a wife share together. Outside of that, when we understand the resurrected body you and I are going to get in heaven, we're not going to have sexual desire, so we're not going to need intimate release like we would in a marriage. So there's no exclusivity of the one flesh union in eternity because those releases are not needed. Don't you remember Paul says, better to marry than to burn with passion. Part of marriage is that it is to fulfill a desire that you and I have, a desire for one another. That's not going to be a part of our existence in heaven. And so to say that we won't be given in marriage is not to say that we won't know each other in heaven, that maybe even we were spouses. I'm going to argue with you. I think we will know that. We will know our family relationships. We will know about the things of this earth. But it's just to say that the necessary element of marriage that is important, that God ordained to be in marriage, is not going to be a part of heaven because our bodies will be Different. So Jesus tells him, number one, you don't know the power of God. Number two, you don't know the scriptures. And what he does is he quotes God as God spoke to Moses from the burning bush. If you'll look down, verse 31. Concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now this would have been long since Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died when God spoke to Moses. The people of Israel were already in Egypt, probably been there about 400 years. 
they had been in that place and God was going to bring them out of Egypt, right? We're studying that in our Old Testament geography class. And what God does is he identifies himself to Moses by saying, I am, I am the God of Isaac, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob. Now, God does not say I was the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, but he says I am. Now, if God says I am, and then Jesus follows up by saying God is the God of the living and not the dead, what is the therefore there? Well, if God is the God of Jacob, Abraham, and Isaac, and God is the God of the living and not the dead, then somewhere, some, somehow, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are living. They're alive. I would believe that would be beyond the, the, the realm of our physical life. Um, I kind of got into a deep hole. I kind of fell down the rabbit hole when I got to this point in my lesson preparation. I don't know if many of you have prepared lessons, but there are occasions where I fall down the rabbit hole. It takes up like a whole afternoon. And I began to look at some of the beliefs of the resurrection, especially in this time. I actually found an interesting thing about the Greeks. Especially, uh, Plato promoted the idea that each one of us, our bodies, is like a prison for the soul. And that when we die, our soul is released and it goes back into the ever-flowing realm of spiritual worldliness that's out there. It's like a, our soul is a drop of water that goes back into the ocean. The problem with that is that when a drop of water goes back into the ocean, it has no physical identity. The Bible doesn't say that God was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that as if when they died, their soul dropped back into the ocean of what is the great cosmos that God created. No, they, once they died, still existed, still existed as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God was still their God. So they still had their identity beyond the grave. And that's what Jesus, I believe, is pointing out here, that God was not the God of them in the past tense, but he is the God of them now. I think it both speaks to Abraham and it speaks to God and Isaac and Jacob today. All right, let's go to another passage. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. So if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still have their identity when God says that, they're dead. Uh, we're going to learn later. Remember Matthew chapter 8, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still mentioned there. Well, we're going to get Abraham again. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Again, I'm, I'm taking you all these passages because I just don't want to give you a preacher's canned answer. Yes, we're going to know each other. Let me show you. I'm trying to show you why I believe this, why I came to this conclusion of the fact that we'll know each other. Okay? People still had their identity beyond the grave. The Bible tells me in many places that you and I probably will know each other, that we'll go, go to see each other, and we'll speak of that in a minute. Luke chapter 16 is probably a fundamental passage that you expected me to go to when we studied this subject of the rich man and Lazarus. And you'll remember beginning in verse 19, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and he fared sumptuously every day. But there was a, a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. Abraham said, Son, remember in your lifetime you received your good things, likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. Let me take a moment to pause and tell you that I believe the purpose of, the, uh, of this story is not about the afterlife life. I believe the purpose of what Jesus is talking about is that if you and I do not deal rightly with one another, the tables turn at the end of time, that we will give an account for how we treat one another. I think that's the purpose of this parable. I don't think it's about the afterlife, but that's included. Okay. He says, Lazarus, he had his evil things, you had your good things, and now he's comforted, you're tormented. Besides all this, between you and me, there is a great gulf that is fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said to him, which I never understood why the rich man asked this afterwards. He just told him nobody could pass back and forth. And then the rich man says, well, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would, uh, you would send him to my father's house. Uh, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham just told him that there's not going to be uh, any leaving these places. We're not going to make some tri trips around 
uh, to come down there, you go up there. It doesn't seem like we can leave, and suddenly he's asking him to do this, but I think he does it from a heart of sincerity. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If you do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And we know that's true today because Jesus did rise from the dead, and people are still not persuaded. So that came true. Here are some obvious ideas from this account that I think relate to you and I knowing one another. Uh, some people have argued about whether or not this is a parable. Um, I don't think it's a parable because none of Jesus' parables called people by name. They're people who have names in this. But also beyond that, even if it is a parable, just because something's a parable doesn't mean it isn't true. It's just an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Uh, the, the Good Samaritan very well was in the realm of possibilities. Uh, the Prodigal Son very easily could have happened. Even though they were parables, uh, the lost sheep, the lost coin, all those things could have happened. So just because something is a parable doesn't mean that it's outside the realm of reality. Some people have argued that this is a parable, so it's not a real story. Either way, it still teaches a truth. In this story, every single person was aware of where they were. Every person was. Abraham was aware. Seems Lazarus was aware. Seems the rich man was aware. All of them were aware of where they were and the consequences of that. The rich man recognized Lazarus and Abraham. Here's our point. He knew who they were. He knew very clearly who they were. Now, I don't think the rich man had a photo of Abraham from long ago that they hung up in a museum. You know, they didn't have ph photography then. So he probably recognized him with an understanding that is given to us beyond the grave. Okay? But he knew who Abraham and Lazarus both were. Abraham also tells the rich man, interestingly enough, to remember. He tells him to remember. We ask sometimes, are you and I going to remember the things of earth beyond the grave? I think that this could lend to us saying, yeah, maybe we will. We'll remember the things of the earth beyond the grave. He tells him to remember, which means he has the ability to remember. Uh, now, I do not believe that the Abraham's bosom that's brought out here in the King James and the New King James, the, the place where Lazarus was taken, is the name of the place where he was. I think it's the description of where he was. You remember in the, in the culture of that time, they would recline at a table and they would be said to be in someone's bosom. You remember in John 13, John was said to have leaned against the bosom of the Lord. He was in the Lord's bosom, John 13 and verse 23 says. It seems to me that this may be a recalling of Matthew chapter 8, that we'll come and we'll have table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Maybe that's part of paradise. I'm not quite sure, but I think there's a connection there. After doing some of that original language study, I think that's what is being talked about here. Everyone knew where they were. Everyone knew who everyone was. They recognized one another. They could remember things from the earth. It doesn't really seem that they know what was going on, but they do remember what the situation was when they left, and they know why they got there. They were informed. Luke 16. All right, let's look at one more example here of will we know each other. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. This is just going to be a quick read. Uh, I actually throw this, threw this one in at the end. I ran across it this afternoon and uh, decided to toss it in the lesson. Revelation chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. You remember this is the opening of the seals of the scroll in the book of Revelation. If you want to remember what that's about, we did a whole series on the book of Revelation. We have those CD recordings in the back. Verse 9 is the fifth seal, the cry of the martyrs. And if you want to remember who those people were, you can go back and listen to that CD. We spent a great deal of time talking about who they were. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord? Holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth. And if you'll remember from that lesson, we pointed out in Revelation chapter 6, I believe these are people who were killed in the persecution of Christians in the first century, and that they were crying out about the things that they had endured. It was Brother Guy in Woods that pointed out these things. He said, first, the people depicted here were people that had died for their faith. They were real personalities in the life after. He said, second, they knew who they were. Do I believe that in heaven you and I will know who we are? Yeah, I think we do. I think Revelation 6 lends to that. Third, they were conscious of where they were. They knew who was there listening to their cries. 
Number four, they had been murdered and they knew that, so they remembered the things of earth. And number five, they were aware that their murderers had yet to be punished. So do you and I know what's going on on earth beyond the grave? I'm not sure, but Revelation chapter 6 seems to lend that way. So our question here, are you and I going to know each other in heaven? I believe 100% certain we're going to know each other in heaven. I don't think you can look at these. And I had a couple other examples I omitted from this study before we dove into it. I think without a doubt we're going to know who each other are in heaven. We're not going to roam around mindlessly not knowing there's just uh, spiritual orbs or spiritual bodies around us and we don't recognize them. In fact, the Bible does tell us that we don't know what we'll be like. 1 John chapter 3, all we know is that we'll be like Him. That's what we know. We might not know everything, but I know that for certain, that we'll be like Jesus in His glorified state. And so that's what we will look like. Uh, if you go back to Job, Job seems to talk about how his eyes would see the Lord. He said he has his eyes and his flesh would be before God. So uh, take that with you as you will. Also remember that Jesus presented himself to Doubting Thomas and he said, A spirit doesn't have flesh and blood like I have. So we kind of get a hint at what his body was like after he rose from the dead. So that's our question number one. Will you and I know each other? Will we recognize our relatives? 100% certain. I think we will. Okay, here's our next question, and these last two will be pretty quick. Okay, will heaven be like a reunion? Will it be a big reunion in the sky? Yeah, in some aspect I think it will be. Now at first I was tempted to say no, because that's kind of my typical response. Will heaven be like a big reunion in the sky? No, it won't. We're going to be there for God. But, you know, actually as I began to investigate, I found out that, yeah, part of heaven will be that we are re reunited with those who have been faithful the church will be brought up together and presented before God. For instance, 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 23, the passage about David's child. He said in that passage, I shall go to him. David wanted to be reunited with that child. So yeah, in some sense, going to the life after will be a reuniting for those who are children of God. The second one is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And uh, in reality, I could probably do a whole lesson just on this passage because you remember the problem with some of the people in this particular letter was their belief about the second coming of Jesus, and they had kind of given up, really, on the pursuits of life because they were just standing, waiting on Jesus to come back, and uh, they weren't doing what they were supposed to do for their families and for the church. And they were kind of, uh, I heard a preacher give a sermon one time called Mooching Off the Church. And he talked about the people that uh, Paul wrote to. It's kind of what was happening. They were not doing anything and being a burden to others. But at the end of that, in, for, in 2 Thessalonians 4 and verse 17 and 18, he's speaking of when you and I will be called up to be with God. And he says that the church will be brought up before God so... We will always be with the Lord. So we will always be with the Lord. Paul inclusively speaks of the whole group and then says the knowledge that we, remember they were worried about people who had already died, the knowledge that we will be with the Lord should be something that collectively the church should encourage one another with. That was his message to those people. We will be with the Lord, encourage the church with these words. So the idea that you and I will be in heaven together, yes, it seems to be somewhat of a great spiritual reuniting. I have a few people that I know that have gone on that to my understanding have lived faithful to God. I look forward to being with them again. Now, again, at this point, going to heaven... And being in heaven for eternity will be mainly about praising God. And we pointed that out at the beginning. But there is a sense in which you've probably got friends that are in heaven. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that I've got more friends in heaven than I have on earth because it seems that the, the more places you go, the more places you visit, the more churches you go to, you begin to find people and you make friends everywhere, right? You get friends all over the place. But I've got some friends in heaven that I'm excited to see. And you may be the same way. Some people you, you want to see one day, right? So we will be with the Lord. Encourage one another. I don't think it's wrong to think of heaven being a place in which we will be with others that have been faithful. 
That's a proper thing to evaluate heaven as. And then, of course, Matthew 8, 11 through 12, our time is expiring, so I'm going to uh, just mention this briefly. Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12 seem to lean to the idea that sitting at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is being in the eternal kingdom of God because there were some sons of the kingdom, speaking of Israel in the context of Jesus' message, who would be pushed out and there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And if you remember the parable of the ten virgins, some who were prepared, some who were not. The problem was they needed to be prepared and when the door was shut they couldn't get into the banquet. It seems that there is a messianic banquet that takes place in eternity, figuratively probably in the text, where we will be seated at a table figuratively with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Matthew chapter 8 verses 11 through 12. I don't think that's speaking of the church. I believe that's a speaking of the eternal kingdom of heaven. It will be somewhat of a reunion. Is it proper for us to say we'll ask Peter a question? If we know each other and, and we know who Peter is and we can communicate, yeah, sure, that's proper. I'm sure if we can communicate, you've got a whole slew of questions. I've made a list so long of things I plan to ask when I get to heaven that I probably won't remember them all. But we'll be there long enough for our memories to be jogged, right? Even further than that, I believe our memories will be better. Which brings us to our last question. Are we going to miss our family? To answer this question, we must turn to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, and I'm going to encourage you to read the entirety of this passage at home. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Above everything else, let me point out this fact here quickly. The Bible tells me that the judge of heaven is going to do what's right. The Bible tells me that the judge of heaven will do what's right. Now, I learned some time back that it was not my job to determine who goes to heaven by ushering them in independently by my own opinion and thoughts. Can you and I judge righteous judgment Absolutely. The Bible teaches us to do so. Can you and I look at others and evaluate their way of life and determine whether they've done right or wrong to the extent that we look at the outward appearance? Yes, but also remember the Bible says in 1 Samuel 16 that God looks in at the heart and the heart is something you and I can't see. So it's not you and I's job to stand and say they go to heaven, they don't go to heaven. I am thankful that God makes that determination. I can, and you can tonight, take that burden off your shoulders. It's not your job. It's not my job. What my job is to remember that the judge of heaven will do what's right. And it's a good thing he's the judge of heaven and not me because I would not do what's right. The Bible tells me as much. God is going to assign people into heaven and hell, Matthew 25, and we could list passages all day long. Psalm 7 and verse 11 says that God is a righteous judge. You and I will never be a righteous judge. We can say that we believe certain things based on this word. You and I can judge righteously based on the righteousness that comes out of this word, but there is none that is righteous, no, not one, except God himself, Psalm 7 and verse 11. God is a righteous judge. Even beyond that, not only is God a righteous judge, the throne upon which he sits is founded on righteousness and justice, something that you and I cannot say about ourselves. Even beyond that, something that we would not be capable of is 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17. God judges impartially. Impartially. You and I, by our very definition, are partial. We will forgive ourselves for things that we would never forgive others for. We hold ourselves to a standard sometimes that we would rarely hold others Two, we would give them a much stricter set of guidelines than we often give ourselves. In fact, that's what Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 11 says. Paul says, how can you escape, O righteous man? You can hear the sarcasm in his voice. You judge others based on the, th the very things that you do. And uh, it's in the, the New King James, and I'll kind of leave you with this thought. Uh, this will maybe serve as our invitation here. It's in Romans chapter 2. I, I love this passage. Okay, I love this passage. Romans chapter 2, uh, he's talking about, you know, we judge others. Uh, we judge others for things that we do. We're condemning ourselves by doing that, verse 2. We know that the judgment of God is according to truth. That's God's judgment. It's much purer than our judgment may ever be. 
The judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things, the things he's listed previously. Do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same thing, that you will escape the judgment of God? Do any of us think that we'll escape the judgment of God? The answer is no. Every man, regardless of money, regardless of uh, popularity, regardless of convincing techniques, will stand before the righteous judge of the universe. Every one of us will. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? You know, sometimes when we have trouble getting people to turn away from their sins, it would do good for us to swallow this passage over and over and over again. It is God's goodness that leads people to repentance. God's goodness, not my effectiveness with words. Sometimes we think if we'll just talk to somebody the right way, they'll repent. It's not us. It's God's goodness that leads people to repentance. That's Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. Verse 5, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent hearts, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You know what Romans chapter 2 and verse 5 tells me? That on the day of judgment, no matter who you are and no matter what you've done, every person will have it revealed to them that God's judgment is righteous. And I think beyond the grave, you and I are going to understand that better. Because the way you and I would judge today would be partial. It would be unrighteous. But on the day of judgment, every one of us will be able to say, you know what? Everything God brought against me was right. Everything he said about me was right. He's a righteous judge. And God stands at that seat of judgment. So will you and I miss our family that aren't there? I think we're going to know that they're not there. I think we will. I don't think I can, I can move that away because the, the rich man knew about his brothers and, and Lazarus was aware. And you've got all these other instances in which God has people who are in their actual identity in heaven. So I think you and I are going to know, but I think there will be a level of understanding that we have that on the day of judgment, it will be revealed to us that God is a righteous judge and he did what's right. And he'll always do what's right. And it is a good thing that you and I don't have to stand in that place. He bears a burden that you and I do not have to bear. And to soak that in and to really believe that is a, it is a freeing thing to know that the same God that will judge me is the same God that will judge you, and he's not going to be partial to you. The only thing that is going to determine a change in the judgment of God is when he looks at us and he either sees the blood of his son or he does not. That's the only change in judgment that will come from God. So my question to you is this tonight. You will stand before the righteous judge. Every one of us, every individual will stand before the righteous judge and God will judge you rightly. He will not do it impartially. He won't judge you unfairly. He won't accuse you of things that you've never done. You're never going to be thrown under the bus by someone else. God will judge us rightly. My question is, are you ready to be rightly judged? Are you ready to stand before the judge of the universe? We spoke this morning about how you and I aren't responsible for people. We're responsible to people. And the only person you are responsible for, that you can control what they do, is you in this moment. You can't control what you did yesterday because it's past. It's gone. You can't go back and change it. And you can't control what you'll do in the future because you're not there. The only thing that you can control is you right now. So my question is, are you ready to stand before the righteous judge of the universe? Because he will judge you and I righteously based on our sin. The beautiful message of the gospel is that you can stand before him sinless. You can stand before him righteous because of Christ. Because Jesus stood in our place and hung on that cross. So if you need to respond to the invitation so that you're prepared to stand before the righteous judge, please understand that you are the only person that can step out of the aisle to cause you to come down, to cause you to sit down, or if you're standing in your place and there's a sin that is between you and the Lord or you and, and, and some select friends around you or your family, and you say, you know what, I want to I repent right here. I haven't brought shame on the church. I haven't done anything public. This has just been something between me and the Lord or this is something I've done in private. You need to repent right where you are. That's the beauty of God. 
1 John chapter 1 says, if you and I confess our sins, He is righteous and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you and I confess, He does what's right because of Jesus. He cleanses us of our sin because of the sacrifice of the Lord. So my question to you tonight is this, are you ready to stand before the righteous judge? Because one day, this whole question, this whole question had to do with heaven. And one day, you'll be ushered into either heaven or hell. You can secure this afternoon. You can make sure that you know where you're headed because of Jesus. And if you need to make sure, if you need to change your life, if you need to obey the gospel, or you just need the support of the church because you say, I want to come back to God and I want to live righteously before God because of Jesus, I need to do that now, then I would encourage you. We have this time set aside. The invitation song will be sung in a moment. We'll all stand up and these pews down here are ready if you need to respond. If you, uh, if you need to come forward to obey the gospel, we have water that's ready. We can talk more about what the gospel entails. We can sit down and study that. Or if you need the support of the church, please come as we stand and sing. If there's anyone here this evening that has not had an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper, you'll come down to one of the two front pews at this time. As we sing one verse of this, you'll be served at this time. <clears throat> Everybody gets a squirt before you leave. No, I'm kidding. We'll cover that in just a moment. First of all, well, let's cover our announcements tonight. I didn't have any updates on our prayer list for the afternoon, so we'll just update and review what we had this morning. Continue to remember David Hightower, Billy Nolan. Remember, she is at Carrollton Manor, room 411 in Carrollton. Also, Charles Nolan, that is Bill's brother. He's in the nursing home as well and Christy Bennett, a neighbor of the Benefields. Please remember her as she recovers from surgery. 
Uh, don't forget, uh, we still have some families traveling. Need to pray for their, uh, their safe return home and also pray for our visitors as they travel home as well this evening or to back to their home. So please remember them. Also, uh, take a look at the long-term prayer, prayer list. Make sure that we remember those names as well. We need to continue to pray for them as if they've got things that are bothering them and it's been going on for quite some time. So please remember those names on that list. Um, and loss in the families and bereavement and loss of loved ones, the Bearden family and loss of Jackie Bearden this past week and also the Truett family and the passing of Missy Truett. So remember those two families. Uh, we do still have several on our COVID prayer list. Let's remember them. Mary Skinner, Eugene Green, Kathleen and Julie Sharp, Jason Harkins, and Greg Nolan, and then Becky and Steve, which is Bill and Billy's uh, daughter and son-in-law. So remember those in our prayers. Just a couple of reminders for this week. Uh, MEP team number two will meet uh, February the 16th, which that'll be Tuesday. So MEP team number two, remember that. Ladies Bible class will be next week. That'll be February the 23rd at 10 a.m. There will be a text sent out for that. So be looking for that. And also just to be prepared, the uh, marriage dis discussion class will begin February the 28th at four o'clock back in the fellowship room and it will be offered virtually if you cannot make the class here at the building. So if you have any questions in regards to the virtual part of it, please see Josh. Um, Jamie sent me an email this afternoon. Uh, I think it was last week. We set up to send over some Valentines to the Moore children. They absolutely love that. They couldn't say thank you enough, Jamie said. So if you had part in sending that over to the Moore kids, they, they really enjoyed the Valentines that they got. So thank you for that. Uh, the squirt bottle here, uh, teachers, for the classrooms, you have some sort of bottle similar to this in your classroom. Uh, make sure you spray your room down after, after every class. This stuff can either be wiped or just sprayed and let dry. So if you need more, please get with me when you run out or for some reason or other your bottle disappears. Let me know and we'll get one of these for the classroom to make sure that you can spray it down and sanitize the classrooms. Uh, of course, you all know Emma and Bailey do a good job keeping the uh, auditorium sterilized. This is just going to save them a little bit of time to uh, not have to every classroom every time. So. Uh, we announced this morning during the second service, but I didn't uh, forget to announce it during the first service. Uh, the elders have approved a pretty significant technology update that hopefully is going to help keep everybody connected. But uh, with that, we're going to have to have a pretty substantial work day. Okay. So if anybody is interested in helping with that, helping us get the technology set up, moved in, got to run cables through the ceiling and things like that. If you're interested in helping, let us know. Let me know. Okay. Everybody hear that? We have a work day for the new technology. And uh, Wesley Benefield can go through that hole between the foyer and the other rooms. So we may have to <laughs> shove him back through there again. So, All right. You're on. If you'd like, please stand. After this song, we'll have our closing prayer. Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace from the
Let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, we are so thankful for another day that we have been able to come here and study your word. We're grateful for the word that has been spoken here today, and we pray that each one of us will take the things that have been said, apply them to our heart, and help us to live a better life for you. Father, we pray that you would be with all of those who were mentioned on our sick list, that you would grant them the blessings that they stand in need of from day to day, that they may regain a portion of their health and be restored to their health once again. Father, we realize that there's probably many, many more out there who, who need our prayers and your help, and we just pray that if we that you would look down on the ones that, that need your blessings today and grant them the things that they stand in need of. Father, we pray that you continue to bless us here in this place as we work to do the work that you have put before us, that you will continue to bless us with the, with the many blessings that we've had, the, the people that we've been able to reach out to, and help us to reach out to the others who we have not met yet. Father, we pray that you be with us as we go to our places of abode tonight. Give us peace and safety and health. And be with us until we meet again. In Christ's name we ask. Amen.